it's very hard to, to describe Picot without doing that. You see everybody when they start talking about Picot, they do that. Although actually it probably won't actually look like that, it'll look more like this, I think, probably. But basically it's the idea that the, the important point that matters isn't the point when you use the last drop of oil, it's the point when you use about half of it. And it's, it's like in a car, for example, whether your tank is completely full or you've only got an egg cup worth of petrol left in it, it still runs exactly the same. Whereas in an economy, it's that midway point. And the, the idea of peak oil emerges from observing how oil fields work around the world, their lifespan, and then, and then magnifying that to nations and then to whole, the whole world. And all oil producing nations follow a pattern where they, they, they peak in discovery and then about 30, 40 years later they peak in production. The world peaked in discovery in 1965 and a lot of experts think that, that we're nearing the peak of production now. And why that matters is because all the way up this, this peak towards this peak then demand drives supply so the more we want the more we can have Saudi Arabia can open the taps pr produce more we've built more and more of an infrastructure uh, industry society around this flow of cheap oil that has sustained everything once we go over this point at the top then that changes around and supply dictates demand we can only have as much as there is and in effect as Colin Campbell describes it we reach the end of the age of cheap oil it's not that we run out of oil but the implications of running out of cheap oil when our entire economic system has been based on borrowing from the future, creating debt based on future generations being able to pay them and actually that has in turn has been based on a presumption that they will have the cheap oil to enable that to be the case is a, is a, is a switching point of, of, enormous, of enormous significance. Colin Campbell is, is seen really as being the grandfather of peak oil really. He's the person who, who co-authored the first paper on peak oil in 1998. He's the founder of the Association for the Study of Peak Oil. He's really the first person people go to to find out about peak oil. He worked in the oil industry for 40 years and what's intriguing about him is he's one of the main um, uh, proponents of the peak oil theory but he also is very much a product of the oil industry and that quite a few of those key people who are the who are the people who are really putting forward the the peak oil uh, theory aren't people who are sort of wild-eyed conspiracy theorists from down and up in the forest you know they're people who worked in the oil industry for 40 years and actually are sort of whistleblowers from within the industry rather than people from the outside well for the last 10 years i was living in in ireland in the southwest of ireland and was very involved there in teaching permaculture and eco-village development and natural building and a very sort of hands-on uh, solutions based educational kind of approach and was set up one of the first eco-village developments they got planning permission in Ireland built the first cob buildings built there for quite a long time and did lots of that kind of thing and as part of that also set up the first two-year full-time permaculture course in the world at a college in Kinsale in Ireland <coughs> and um, it turned out that in September 2004, the first day of term, uh, somebody gave me a copy of this film, The End of Suburbia, which I didn't have a DVD player, so I'd not seen. So I thought, I know, I'll show it to the students on the first day of term. And it turned out that just up the road was where Colin Campbell lived. I'd never actually heard of him before. But a friend of mine who'd already seen it said, oh, you should get in touch with Colin Campbell. He just lives up the road and he's in the film. So I'd, not knowing who Colin Campbell was, or not knowing anything about Pico, I just rang him up and said, hi, uh, I wonder if you might come in and talk to my students in, in Kinsale. He said, certainly, certainly, certainly. So he, so he came along and, um, and uh, so the first day of term they had, they had Colin Campbell and the end of suburbia. So it was, quite a, it was quite an impact on them, really. The concept of transition towns originated with this, the work that we did in Kinsale, where after we'd, we'd had this double whammy from Colin and the end of suburbia and everybody was sort of reeling and thinking, my God, this is, where did this come from? You know, I've been involved in environmental things for 15 years and I'd never caught the idea at all. I just thought, oh, that'll be, I had this idea that one day in 2050 someone would put the last drop of oil into a car and it would be this gentle thing. Um, but with the second year students on the permaculture course there, we started thinking about, well, what does this mean for the town of Kinsale? How is Kinsale going to adapt to this? You know, we could just sit here, not do anything, let this unfold as a series of lurching crises, or we could actually try and pull together uh, all the different aspects of the town and really, really look at this. Because if we're able collectively to design 
a way through this using our intelligence, our ingenuity, our creativity, then there's no reason why the future with less oil couldn't be a preferable place to the present. That's really where, where, the, uh, where the idea originated. It was in a very, very simple idea, and it's still at its heart is the very simple idea that the future with less oil could be preferable to where we are now. Because, you know, when you actually look at what... If you look now in countries like India, there's this process that's going on of trying to vilify the rural, vilify the simple, vilify um, the kind of um, pre-industrial... Uh, the local and trying to really rubbish that and it's a process that happened when I was living in Ireland it happened in Ireland in the 60s and 70s all the old buildings being pulled down people being you know the horses and carts were no good and supermarkets and so on the same process happened here in the 40s and 50s um, so the idea emerged that actually you know the future with less oil could be preferable but that we need to re in, in doing that we really need to rediscover what was actually good about about the life before cheap oil you know that actually like us we've had this whole process of vilifying that that's been the case around the world but actually part of this is, is looking back to what was good about this and in, in in Totnes what we've been doing is a series of oral history interviews with old people of their memories from from life in this town between the 30s and the 50s you know when cheap oil really came in and really started to change things and when you do that, you find out about you know how, how resilient people were in those days, how how everybody could ha had skills they could turn their hand to, uh, dig for victory with victory gardens. I think it was called in the US, wasn't it? You know that was that was possible in those days because everybody knew how to to garden. They hadn't been to gardening college, but they knew in, they knew by osmosis how to garden. Nowadays, if you said to people, "Here's a spade, dig a hole," you know you'd have lots of people who could design the hole. There's lots of people who could, could quantity survey the hole and spec the hole up for you, put the hole digging out to tender, and they could ensure the hole digging process against public uh, indemnity, all this kind of thing. But actually, there'd be very few people who would actually dig. You know, so so we, we we've really moved away from a from being a very sort of hands-on practical kind of society. Um, so the transition towns process is really about trying to look to draw what was good about life before cheap oil. And also not to romanticise it, but that there is a lot that we can that we can learn from that. So we're trying to apply the best of the old, the best of the new, but it's really a process of us getting people to ask the right questions. I think is a very important part of it. You know, when when you look at a town like Tottenham, all the plans that the local government draw up, local development plans, community development plans, they're all based on the assumption that climate change won't happen for is significantly for us, uh, an ignorable amount of time that oil prices will always remain cheap, that the move away from the sort of household economy will continue, that will become less and less useful in that sense. And all of those things are really highly questionable. And this process, the transition town process, I really like to think of as being a catalyst, that you come into a town, it's a catalyst for getting people to think about this process. You know, ask the right questions. On the front of our flyer, there's just the question, can you imagine Totnes beyond oil? You know, And that's really the question this process is asking. We don't claim to come in with all the answers. Maybe in some, maybe in some of the questions there aren't actually any answers. You know, But uh, I think the it's about coming in with the question rather than breezing in with lots of experts who will design everything for everybody. It's really a question of of unleashing the collective genius of the community around you to engage in addressing this this hugely important question. The process of of doing a transition town is is one of is one of trying to engage all the different sectors. I I I think you know people like Lester Brown talk about the challenge that peak oil presents as requiring a response like a wartime mobilization. The Hirsch report talks about a crash program. You know, this, the scale of what we have to do is something we've never ever done before. And as environmentalists, I think the tools that we've had up to this point are inadequate. You know, we've, we've never managed to in have mainstream engagement on, on very much, really. So we're really looking at new ways of doing it. And, and um, when we start in a town, really the first stage is awareness raising and trying to get people switched on to the idea of peak oil, oil depletion. And for me, I think peak oil is a much more powerful tool for engaging people in thinking about these issues than climate change. Because peak oil, Richard, as Richard Heinberg puts it, people are more instinctively interested in, um, in what's going into their car rather than what's coming out of the exhaust pipe. 
you know it's a, it's a it's a fuel in problem rather than an emissions out problem um, and peak oil is very powerful because it's like putting a mirror up to a community and saying where's the resilience gone in this community where is this ability community's ability to withstand shocks and you know particularly when we look back to the 30s and 40s we see that actually then we had that resilience we had a vibrant local economy we had local food we had local agriculture <laughs> The car parks you see over behind us there used to be, up until the early 1980s, uh, a market garden run by a man called George Heath. And he had five or six glass houses running down the hills on the south facing slope. It was recorded as, a, as being uh, land for growing food on back as far as the Doomsday Book. And uh, <clears throat> there was a cattle market at the top of town where the manure would be scraped off, composted, and then he used it as part of his, his market gardens to grow flowers, fruit and vegetables, which were then sold in the town in a shop right on the high street, which you can see just behind you. What's important about, about the model that you see in the garden that was here behind us was, was that it was... Um, was that it was a very powerful, dynamic form of urban agriculture. And in countries like Cuba, where they actually have experienced the effects of peak oil, they've started to move much more to these urban, urban land use models. So what we had here was the perfect post-carbon, zero food miles, low energy uh, form of agriculture. Food being grown where people live uh, and then brought to where the people are. You don't have to go back very far. Um, but so I suppose this, the first stage of doing the, the transition time process is the awareness raising, which here we did for about a year of talks, film showings, networking with existing groups, trying to do talks for as many diverse groups as possible. And then I like to think of that as being like, um, do you know those, those toy volcanoes that children have where you put vinegar and bicarbonate of soda in and then they froth up all over the table and stain the carpet and those things. It's a bit like that, that you spend your first year putting that in until you build up this pressure. And here, by after, after a year, we, there was really this energy behind doing something. And then that's when we have an evening that we call the official unleashing of Transition Town Totnes, which was <coughs> the evening designed to be the evening that historically people would look back to and say that was the evening when it all started. We had 400 people came along. The mayor of Totnes in, uh, introduced it. And it was very, very powerful, uh, dynamic evening. And that really has created a lot of momentum that, is, that, that has driven us forward ever since. But I think, I think it's really important that, that the, the momentum, the drive for this, comes from individuals rather than from local authorities. But what you're creating is, is something which then interfaces with local authorities in a way that few things have in the past. And I don't know about, I imagine in the US, but I know in the UK, there's this real sort of split between people in government who think that communities don't care, they're apathetic, they can't be bothered, and, and the communities who think the government aren't interested, the government don't care, and there's very little dynamic interface between the two, and there are various initiatives that have tried to do that, but I think the, the transition town model really tries to, 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 to focus the mind on, 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 a, on the question that local authorities can't ask you know in a sense local authorities it's very particularly the ones who need to be elected every year for them to say well we're actually planning for the end of cheap oil and for relocalization that's a scary leap for them to make whereas if you've got the voice coming up which is really thought it through and developing plans at the local level for how that's going to work i think you have a really dynamic interface there and the replicability of this model on different scales is one that we're still exploring, really. I mean, Kinsale was about 2,800 people. Totnes is about seven or 8,000. Um, my sense is that this process works on a scale over which you feel you have a sphere of influence. So London, for example, is too big. Um, uh, on a small village scale it would work although if you have too few people I would imagine it's hard to generate sufficient energy behind doing it and it's still what's, ha what's happening now is that inspired by the transition town Totnes model we now have eight or nine different transition towns around the country some of which are small villages some of which are cities so we really we, we, we really have models over the whole spectrum so it's intriguing to see how they do it uh, my sense is that in urban areas you're looking at working on the neighbourhood scale and the, the city I grew up in Bristol 
in, in the southwest of England, like a lot of other cities, is basically historically a collection of villages that have merged together and that have very much have those distinctive elements to them with their own identity. And so I think the idea is that you work at that scale. So you have transition Clifton, transition wherever, the different parts of the town. And then you have a transition city Bristol body whose role is to support, train and resource those different initiatives and try and inspire them. Um, I think it seems to work perfectly with Totnes is, is, an, is a, historically is a market town and I think those market towns work very very well because they're of a scale where they have a hinterland uh, which is quite defined you know the villages which would historically have brought their produce into the market towns that sets a sort of a, a, a surrounding kind of a region for it I mean it, it is still an evolving part of this but I think m my gut sense is that is that it has to work on a scale that you can that you can conceive of a scale where you can that you can get your head around where you can you can appreciate how how big it is and if it starts to get too big you break it down into its parts really i think it's something that people will just get a feel for for wherever they are so in like um uh havana people um started raising i think they're raising 60 percent of their vegetables now in yes the, in the city even though it's a city yes yeah well, I think that I mean the whole the whole question of urban agriculture is is going to really really um, play a huge huge part in in, in the future here, and, and it's really a luxury of of the age of cheap oil that we've been able to um, put food production off miles away in in tidy little sheds and, and where we don't have to see it, and our urban landscapes are completely devoid of anything edible. You know, one of the things that, that has always really struck me is, is, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, if you go to new developments like business parks and shopping, out-of-town shopping places, that we've developed this way of landscaping where we've bred plants specifically to be completely useless. Low-maintenance ground cover shrubs. What is the point of a low-maintenance ground cover shrub? And flowering cherry trees that just make flowers and no cherries. You know, I mean, we've, we've got so far away from common sense, it's terrifying. And one of the things that we're doing in Totnes is launching a project that we call the uh, Totnes, the nut tree capital of Britain, where we want to plant walnut trees throughout, throughout the town and really put in place an infrastructure of, of, of productivity throughout the town. You know, why is it that we have a townscape which is full of trees, but you can't eat any of them? What's the point of that? You know, we could actually plant walnut trees, sweet chestnuts, which produce as much carbohydrate and protein per acre as walnuts, as, as sorry, as, as um, barley and wheat and so on. And they lock up carbon and they're beautiful and things can live in them and so on. You know, but we could put those in through the town as, a, as an infrastructure that's there. Behind me is Veer Island, which is uh, which is right in the heart of the town of Totnes, and uh, this is a place where, in a couple of days, with the with the mayor of Totnes, we're going to be planting two walnut trees and five almond trees, as a as a way of instigating and launching the uh, the uh, nut tree capital of Britain project. So uh, they're going to be very vigorous hybrid walnuts and almonds, and uh, we should get a lot of press coverage with this and. Uh, get the whole idea of urban productive trees on the map. Now, has this become an has this been adopted uh, and embraced by officials and officially? Uh, the, the in Kinsale, the, the energy descent plan we did for Kinsale was adopted by the town council. It was unanimously voted for by the town council, which was quite amazing. And then it won a big environmental award in Ireland that year as well. Um, the process here has had a lot of support from various members of the of the town council and the local authority. Uh, in fact, next week I'm doing a talk to the town council on their invitation, and part of that is to is to invite them to pass a motion in officially endorsing the objectives of Transition Town Totnes. The mayor has been very supportive. She spoke at our opening. She's also going to be. Uh, planting some walnut trees with us in the middle of Totnes in a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of interest from people. I mean, what we want to do is to take what was called the Totnes Community Plan, which was developed over a period of time, and take that as the framework to develop into an energy descent plan.
because it drops the word sustainability in here and there, but it really doesn't understand what it means. And actually, it would give us, in terms of increasing Totnes's resilience, it does nothing at all. But it is also, it has a lot of recognition. So if we can get an energy descent plan in its place, but using the same format, you know, we'll, we'll be kind of harnessing a lot of the power that, that was, is within the local authority. Although The End of Suburbia is a fantastic film and, 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 and really, really totally transformed my way of thinking about all of this, um, I think the, 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 the title is somewhat misleading because... Suburbia, as James Kunstler says, is you know, the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world, but at the same time it's there, that's what we have. And, and David Holmgren, who's the co-founder of Permaculture, his approach is to argue that we need, rather than it being about the end of suburbia, or, or as the sequel is called, the escape from suburbia, you know, it's more about retrofitting suburbia, redesigning suburbia, rethinking suburbia. You know, in, in some ways there's, there's, there's good things about suburbia in that, in that you have larger... Uh, gardens and and so on, and that there is the land there if 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 we can start to think about it, to um, you know to, to to really rethink that in a very productive kind of a way. Um, <clears throat> what's been interesting here, looking back historically in Totnes to back to 1945 at the end of the war, is that um, the buildings were inhabited in a completely different way. Buildings that are now one just one family living in a five-bedroom house in in Totnes, or a building which is now offices. Every room of that was a family living in there, you know. With a, and, and the buildings were inhabited in a completely different way because that was the need at the time. Um, and I think we we'll, we have to look at how we re-inhabit suburbia. You know, do we just have one family living in a huge house, or actually can that house be broken down into bits and and uh, made much more much more energy efficient in that way? So I think it's it's rather than thinking that we can that we can just ditch all the infrastructure that we have in place, you know, we don't have that luxury. And I, I think it's one of the one of the weaknesses of the permaculture or alternative lifestyles movement, for example, is that we focus so much on a natural building movement is that we focus so much on new build. And actually, we have in Totnes, for example, you know, even if we had the most amazing systems of local building. There's there's a handful of new houses built here every year. Planning is so hard to get, and there's so few spaces to build. That the challenge is how do we use local, natural, or sustainably produced materials to retrofit buildings like this, which are vastly en energy en energy inefficient. So um, it's not a case of abandoning suburbia or escaping from suburbia. Um, I think it's a case of coming back to suburbia. With with a new way of looking at it, and with new and with new insights, new imagination, and new creativity. When we produced the the Kinsale Energy Descent Action Plan in 2005, uh, we, we we printed 500 copies. We didn't think we'd get through 500 copies. Well, who's going to want to read this? It's a student project, you know. and uh, so but they all went very very quickly. In fact, I think about 100 of them went to Australia. Somebody just ordered 100 in a box, so they all disappeared over there. Then we put it on the on the net, and people could download it. It's been downloaded nearly 4,000 times, and different community groups all over the all over the world are, are using it as a template and and as an inspiration for for doing their similar sort of projects. So the Transition Town Totnes initiative really began properly September last year, September 06. And since then, there's now nine different transition towns around the country and there's new ones getting in touch all the time. And it really has a, has a, there's something very viral about it, that it's really a simple, simple concept, but it's a concept that's really of its time. And that, um, you know, people, people can, get to feel so despondent with uh, with climate change with peak oil particularly uh, you know people who have young children or who the net for whom the next generation is something tangible sitting in front of them at breakfast every day and and um, there's something about the concept that really does seem to engage them so we there's now probably the most advanced ones the transition town Lewis in Sussex who are built who they they have their official unleashing on the 24th of April they've done some really brilliant things like uh, there's a little five minute short film that one of their members made about transition town Lewis which is on YouTube and various places <laughs> Climate change. Um, 
Hang on, let me think. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. And they had the local cinema showing that as the trailer to every film in the three months running up to their official unleashing, which is brilliant. And they also were involved, they're involved in a campaign to stop a part of Lewis being developed by a developer and made into something ghastly. And rather than being out there protesting and saying, we don't want this, we must stop this, we must campaign against this, they've come at it from a very different way, the sort of positive solutions way, where they produced this newspaper article written by a journalist called Mavis Happen, that was a newspaper article from 2017 that was talking about how um, how Lewis was now the most sustainable town in the UK and it could all be traced back to this inspirational development that took place on this piece of land in 2008 which then triggered the whole economic regeneration of the town. There's the, there's the town of Stroud in Gloucester, transition town Stroud, they're, they're, they're very moving ahead very strongly and they're looking at doing, that used to be a textiles town, lots of textiles produced there. So they're looking at how they could revive textiles as part of a relocalisation initiative, local currencies. Transition Town Falmouth in Cornwall, there's Transition Penwith, which is an area of Cornwall. They're actually now looking at amalgamating and doing a Transition Cornwall on a, on a, on a, on a bigger kind of scale for the whole county. Um, there's the city of Bristol, who are sort of breaking Bristol down into, into its different parts and, and looking at that. And I had a phone call the other day from Transition Isle of Wight, which is an island off the south of England, which is all rather interesting to do it on that kind of scale. So it does seem to have a momentum behind it as an idea. And, and as I say, it's a very simple idea that the future with less oil could be better. And, and I think climate change campaigning and environmental campaigning really struggles because to engage people because actually it comes from the angle of You'd better change because it's going to be really, really desperately awful, you know. And and the, the 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 supposed motivator for change is sheer terror of how ghastly everything is going to be. And you have people like James Lovelock out there saying nothing any of you can do can make any difference to this. This is just happening, and we're doomed, and we're finished. And and people instinctively just shut down. I think when they when they encounter that. They shut down completely, you know, what can I do? I can't do anything. It's just beyond me. Whereas <coughs> whereas the transition town approach says, this is, could be fantastic. You know, actually life beyond, who says life without oil is going to be awful? Actually, you know, there are people in the world who live who live on a tenth of the oil that we use in the UK and arguably have, have a more fulfilling lifestyle. You know, but we've just become so blinkered that we have to have in order to be happy we have to burn lots of oil uh, and it's and and i think that the, the power with the transition town approach is it's sort of gently taking people's hand and saying come on you know let's we can we can go through this and we can transition this and actually it can be fantastic somebody asked me a question at a talk recently they said you know well uh, what will what will we do if the if the gulf stream shuts off and the yeah. uk plunges into an ice age right I said, um, I, I have no idea. It's a bit like asking, you know, well, the Earth's about to be hit by this huge comet. What do we do? You know, well, there are certain things, you know, if it gets to that stage where the UK is plunged into a per perpetual ice age, mm -hmm. well, then we've had it, really, I guess, you know. But mm -hmm. actually, I suppose the argument is that if you can, if you can get CO2 emissions down underneath, keep them under the, under the two degree thing, and then start to stabilise them from that point onwards, then there's a chance that that doesn't happen. You know, obviously, if we get into runaway, runaway climate change, you know, I, th I think the thing is that if if you, in order to, in order to, in order to avoid the worst excesses, in order to come in under the two degrees, then we have to have this wartime mobilisation scale of things that we've never had before, and then, you know, then there's the, then we can, then we can do it. I think. But obviously, if we tip over five, six, seven degrees, you know, there's no transition towns aren't really going to be much of a much of a much help, really. But it's really, you know, I, I think in order to engage people, there's a thing in the UK that's just happening now where the UK government has proposed road pricing on the roads, uh, kind of a toll on the roads in order to sort of start managing traffic numbers and reduce traffic, which is kind of like road rationing in a sense. And one of those sort of right-wing newspapers organised this petition, and they had eight million people sign this petition. You know, and you think, you know, you, can't, you know, we have to have carbon rationing, and we really need carbon rationing now.
And if this is what people are, if this is the response to that, what, what would it be to carbon rationing? And carbon rationing will happen inevitably. If you have a depleting resource, at some point you have to ration it. The sooner you ration it, the more equitable the process is going to be. But the question is, you know, for, for me, I think that part of the thing with transition towns is it's really kind of softening people up at the grassroots to, rather than saying, rather than because it's, it's a fear response. You know, if you say, we don't want road rationing, we're going to r- sign a petition, we want to keep our cars. You know, but if you have a very gentle process saying, sorry, it's not going to be actually, you know, the cars, we have to let go of the cars, but we have to rethink what we're going to do instead. And actually the future without cars could be far, far preferable to the present with all these blooming cars everywhere. So I think that that's the answer, really, obviously. I mean, at the moment, you know, it is possible that that, that we could heat Totnes, keep people warm sustainably. It's not possible that we could have them all driving hundreds of miles to work every day um you know and i think that's part of the process with the energy descent plan is you know well here's a diminishing energy base do you actually want to use this energy doing frivolous pointless ridiculous things or are we actually we're going to spend this on the, on the essentials which is keeping people warm at, a, at, a, at an affordable price george monbiot is a, is is a writer here who'd write who's one of the leading environmental writers here he wrote a book called heat which tried to set out very practically how the UK emitting only 10% of its current emissions by 2030, what it would look like, how we would actually do that. So it looks at energy, food, transport, a whole range of things. Very interesting. I don't agree with all of it, but the thing that was most, the thing that was disappointing about it was at the end, he has this chapter about how we're actually going to do it. There's this massive, unprecedented scale on the, on the scale of gearing up for World War II, you know, within within a very short period of time, engaging all these different parties, constituencies, different vested interests into this thing. So the tools that we have in that are uh, activism, lobbying and protesting. I would argue that actually those are the those are the only tools really the environmental movement has had for the last 40 years and and they haven't been sufficient for the scale of the challenge up to this point and to imagine that they on their own are going to be sufficient for the scale of what we have to do now I think it's just not it's not going to happen so what we're really exploring in the transition town movement is 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 new tools and adding a, creating a synthesis of new tools which draws from uh, from creative teaching approaches that we use in permaculture, um, kind of games and activities, and making things very visual, and getting people out into the, the forest and, and getting people talking to each other, networking, you know, really, really creative ways of engaging people's imaginations. Because some people can read things, some people can watch PowerPoint presentations, a lot of people can't, and you know, we need to have ways of engagement in different ways. Uh, we also use tools like Open Space, World Cafe, these kind of ways of bringing people, large groups of people together to self-organise and have conversations around certain issues. Uh, we use some of the more innovative internet-based things like using wikis and these kind of collaborative information building tools. We're also quite inspired by by insights from the whole area of addictions and um, and looking at the whole question of can we compare our relationship to oil to an addiction? Do we have an addictive relationship to oil, to comfort, to our Western lifestyles? And uh, and I think there's a very strong case to say that we do. And that there are a number of insights that we can draw from the, from the field of addictions, which are very, very useful. And uh, as environmentalists, we've been trying to instigate change for many years, but we've not been that good at understanding the processes of change. Whereas in addiction, there's some incredibly insightful work on change, the processes that people go through. And they argue that the processes people go through going into addiction are the same as the processes they go through coming out of addiction. And they're the same processes that any process of change goes through. The process where you're thinking, oh, there's no problem, I don't need to change. Moving to, well, maybe there's a problem, maybe I need to do something over the next six months, but I'm not in a rush. Then to, in the next month, I'm definitely going to do something. Um, and they call that the pre-contemplation, the contemplation and the preparation stage. The preparation stage being where you've decided you're going to do something. I'm definitely going to put solar panels on the roof. I'm going to do it. I've rung the guy. It's going to happen. I've put the money aside. I'm going to do that. And then that moves on to the action stage, which as environmentalists is where we want to get everybody to. But the insight that comes from, from, from looking at addictions theory is assuming that everybody is at this stage of preparation, all we need to do is give them the right leaflet, 
lend them the right DVD and they'll see the light and start doing everything is deeply erroneous because the majority of people are in the previous two stages and they need very very different stimulus and the danger is that if we as environmentalists if we're assuming that we just treat everybody as if they're at preparation stage that we further and further alienate the people at the other stage and actually lessen their their intention to uh, to respond so we uh, we've had lots of dialogues with the, with 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 the people who are behind the idea of motivational interviewing which is a tool from addictions which is to do with um helping people who are at the stage of trying to decide whether to to leap to, to leap or not this kind of ambivalent period and if for an for an alcoholic it would be well i know i drink a lot but so do all my mates and, and it's fine oh well my wife doesn't like it but you know she'll she's all right she doesn't mind it and you'd go backwards and forwards and so with this issue it might be well i know oil's going to peak soon but well it hasn't peaked yet and some people say it's not going to but well obviously it is and we need to prepare and so on and, and motivational interviewing it is, is a very useful tool to apply at that stage to sort of support people support people through that. You would start by gathering together a small group of people who want to instigate this project and the first thing that you do as that group is that you design the date when you're going to stop existing so that you plan your own obsolescence into the process from the very beginning and your role as that group is to is to organize and provide the awareness raising phase up to the point where you are ready to do this unleashing process and you design that beyond that you don't exist so you design your own Easter as it were where you where you just disappear um, and I think that's really really important and, and so that then what happens is so you spend the first year or first whatever it's different for every place because there's different levels of of awareness on these issues when you arrive in some places it might be shorter some places it might be longer here when it was about a year and that's the period wherein you, you show the end of suburbia, you show the power of community, you do talks, you get visiting speakers in, you do, you make films, you show them around the place, you really try and, um, <clears throat> you really try and build up that, that energy that this is a really important issue and we really need to move on this. And then you plan your official unleashing, which is the historic event <clears throat> where people look back and say that was the evening when it all started. And then, and then you plan a, a program of events which trigger a number of your different groups starting to form. So, uh, for example, we ran an evening called uh, Feeding Totnes Past, Present and Future, where we had a speaker who talked about agri agriculture around this area in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Then we had someone who talked about the present and then a local farmer talk about the, the role of organics in the future. And then that then led into an open space day on food. And from that, the food group emerged. Then we did one on energy, an evening, an open space, and then the, the energy group emerged. So that's the kind of way we're doing it. And then the, the steering group for the project becomes a representative from each of those groups. So your steering group, rather than being made up of a sort of hand-picked group of experts, your, your steering group is the people who have made the commitment in their life that they're going to drive this forward, and it makes things much more dynamic. Um, <clears throat> Then the process is that you're spend is that you're building up towards doing an energy descent plan, and that each of those groups is re <coughs> is responsible for that aspect of the energy descent plan. That's roughly the idea. But it's very it's important at an early stage as well that you start to put in place visible manifestations of the of the project. So, for example, here in Totnes, we're doing the, the tree plantings, the walnut tree plantings in the town. We're also in a couple of weeks launching a pilot local currency system where we're printing 300 Totnes pound notes which will be usable within Totnes. There's about 20 businesses who've signed up that they will, uh, who are on the note that they, that you can spend it there. You can spend it anywhere in Transition Town Totnes, but it's limited for about three or four months as a pilot to see how, it, how, it, how such a currency would work. But that's something, um, that's something which is very powerful. And I think one of the things that, that that this pro process it has to, is doing is about creating new stories and so the evening that we had that was the launch evening was about people telling the story of of how Totnes makes this transition and in fact that's what Energy Descent Plan does is it creates a vision of a powered down abundant localized Totnes 
in about 20 to 30 years time and then it backcasts from there of how you actually get there so you create a roadmap of how you can get there in realizable steps year by year if we collectively pull together we can get from a to z over that period of time but one of the things for example that the local currency does these printed notes will do is it creates a story it's something people have in their hands and it's the potential they can they hold they hold that potential in their hands um, and it's very well, I think that would be a very powerful tangible tool I think many people would say well uh, are we really going to be able to support the numbers of people that we have right now the population mm -hmm. at the um, the current levels well I think the answer to that question is is no if we want to live like we live now if we want to live with a couple of cars and with all the latest gadgets and eating meat once uh, once a day uh, going on holiday abroad you know th no but I think there is there is um, there is a place that we can get to where where we can do and I would argue would it would be a far healthier more pleasant place to be um, you know when you look at the UK for example there, ama amazingly there hasn't been a study done for the UK as to whether the UK could feed itself from its own land mass its own agricultural land since 1975 and that study said well we could do but we have a diet similar to the one we had in World War II and we'd eat a lot less meat. That period during the war, 1939-1945, was actually the time when the UK population was at its healthiest, even though it had the simplest diet of its time, because uh, it was eating much more locally produced vegetables from the 10% of the national diet at that time that was grown on allotments and back gardens and urban agriculture uh, models. And that report from 1975, what it doesn't take into account is different ways of, of producing food. You know, it's very, very questionable that our current intensive agriculture model could actually support the number of people we have now if you take away the, uh, the, uh, the, the cheap subsidised oil inputs and the amount of natural gas that's used to make fertilisers. Um, but if you look at pro approaches like the bio-intensive approach, the, the, the very intensive urban market garden kind of model. Um, you know, I, I, I think the figures are off the top of my head that they argue in the in the bio-intensive movement argue that conventional agriculture requires about 10,000 square feet per person to provide their diet on an annual basis, whereas using bio-intensive approach, you bring it down to about 2,000, and you're doing it where people are. You know it's it's such a profound rethink of everything you know well it's a it's a simple question of can can we support the population that we have and yes we can but we have to we have to rethink lots of very very basic assumptions about how we eat how we work what our urban spaces look like um but quite clearly also we need to we need to start looking that we hit peak population pretty sharpish as well Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, maybe we can sustain what we have now, but if we if we let it keep going up and up and up, then our chances of doing that get less and less all the time. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned uh, food and energy. Uh, are there other sectors or dimensions that you include in the visioning okay. process? Like transport. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think it's very important. That it's one of the. It's it's another of the reasons why I think peak oil is such a is such a powerful motivator for this kind of movement rather than climate change that climate change can very easily be sidelined into being an issue about energy it's about using less energy carbon emissions from energy whereas when you work peak oil into it as well you really develop an, a, the insight that everything that we do happens because cheap oil enables it to happen it's not just about energy it's about food it's about economics and livelihoods it's about um education health and medicine how, one of the big things we're looking at here is how on earth do, do you do you move back to a healthcare system that doesn't rely on medicines that are made from petrochemicals from equipment that is hugely dependent on petrochemicals um and i'll come back to the health thing in a bit but the, uh, so we also look at transport tourism Tottenham is a town very dependent on tourism will that tourism always be there will we have more tourists when people can't afford to fly on airplanes anymore or will we have less because people will be staying at home and uh, enjoying being in their gardens so much they won't actually want to leave them in the summer which is the time when they need to be there watering and harvesting more than they do now um, uh, building construction 
uh, local government, how lo how's local government going to work? You know, it it cuts across all aspects of everything, and I think that's the power of bringing peak oil into it. And if I just say a little bit about the, about the health and the medicine thing, um, I gave a talk a little while ago in in Penzance for the Transition Town Group there, and I said as part of that that one of the things that the Health and Medicine Group in Totnes is doing is looking at the question of what are the ten most frequently prescribed drugs in that doctors in Totnes give to people. Um, do they have a herbal uh, or locally produce, producible replacement? Uh, how much would we need? And to start thinking about building in place a kind of a local apothecary infrastructure, as it were, so that we actually have something to fall back on, because at the moment we don't. You know, and you look in, in, in Iraq now, for example, when, when, the, when the medical supplies stop coming in, it's extremely difficult because there's nothing to fall back on. There's no resilience in terms of the healthcare system. Um, and I, I gave this talk, and this man came up at the end, and he said, "Oh, I'm, I'm a GP. I'm, I'm a doctor. I work, I, I work here in Falmouth and, and in Penzance. And I've been sitting there listening to you um, talking, thinking, well, actually, the ten drug, drugs I prescribe most often are actually for side effects of cheap oil. I'd never thought about it before, but actually, I pre prescribe." this drug which is for obesity, I uh, prescribe this drug which is for excess stomach acid from, from overeating and eating the wrong food, I prescribe this drug which is for stress. You know, he, he listed it all through and he, and he had this, this penny had dropped, you know, which was, yeah, he said, actually, the oil age makes people sick, you know, that actually so many of the diseases that, that we have now are, are diseases that are that are caused by by the lifestyle that, that oil has brought us, and it's the myth that actually the oil age has brought us this fantastic progress and development and marvelous things. You know, actually, you can run alongside, and they did a very good study in in Dublin, in Ireland, where they took the the, the, the growth curve of the Irish economy and the growth curve of of the amount of oil availability in Ireland, which mirror each other pretty much exactly. But then also mirroring that curve, almost exactly, are obesity um, rates, levels of heart disease, days off work from stress, uh, the murder rate, the suicide rate, amounts of people admitted for clinical depression. You know, that all these things follow the same curve. And so in terms of healthcare and medicine and, 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 and how we're going to, to, to respond to that, it's a huge question. But I think, uh, I mean, I think again, if we can really rethink some basic assumptions, we can come to some very exciting conclusions. So, any last thoughts or words of advice or <coughs> encouragement? Yeah, I think, I think that, that, that we, we we find ourselves at a at, at an extraordinary extraordinary point in history and, and I, I for one find it an exhilarating time to be around really you know we have we have we can no longer ignore the the, 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 the signs that we have to do things and on a scale that we've never done before you know it's we, we're faced with the most profound changes and I think we have to really engage people in a way we've never engaged before we have to inspire and enthuse people and, and we, we're inviting people to join us on a collective adventure to embark on a journey to something um, and for me I've been involved in environmental things for a long time I was involved in protest against new roads being built in, in, in the UK in the 90s and anti-nuclear stuff in the 1980s the danger with campaigning against stuff and always campaigning against stuff is that you come up against all the time the sort of the the institutional refusal to shift and and as an activist it's it's exhausting and so many people get really burnt out by doing that kind of work whereas i find doing the transition town approach is is working towards making the same kind of change but it's so nourishing and and, and as someone doing it it really feeds you and you get so much from seeing the seeing the, the kind of enthusiasm that it, that it generates because it because it avoids that them and us dynamic and it comes in underneath the radar an expression by Jean de Buffet who was an artist used to say that uh, art never lies down in the bed that's made for it and its best moments are when it forgets what it's called and I think this process has that sort of 
playful kind of nature and it can put on different hats for, for who it's meeting and it can put on a suit and tie and go along and speak to the council and it can put on wellies and go and talk to farmers and it can go into the schools and it can go and talk to the you know it really has to have that that ability to draw people in and I think I think you can do that so much more effectively be it by being for something rather than being against something and the, I think the power of creating collective visions of where we want to go, of creating a roadmap of how it could be in such a way that people can can smell it and feel it and almost taste it. If you threw your window open in in the morning in 2025 in a in a powered down relocalized Totnes living in a in a in a powered down world, what would it be like? What would it sound like when you look out? What would it, what would you have for breakfast? What would you hear as you walk down the street? Where would where would you go? You know, and I think when there's so much stuff that's bubbling up for people saying, oh, oh, peak oil, climate change, overpopulation, you know, that actually something which, which, which can really, really present that is very, very powerful. One of my favourite quotes is, uh, is uh, Arundhati Roy, who's an Indian novelist, who says, um, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. The clock tower you see behind us is, uh, is one of the most sort of historic landmarks of, of the town and if you look at the logo that we use for the, for the project we've basically incorporated the, the clock tower and then the arch underneath we've turned into the, the oil peak. It's kind of hidden, lots of people don't spot that but it's a hidden message in our logo.